Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kiran Patricha, and I'm with the Ananta Advocacy Center. A very warm welcome to our special program, the Ambassador Series. It's a unique platform that we have set up um, for interaction with heads of foreign missions in India. And uh, today we are delighted, absolutely delighted to have with us uh, His Excellency Emmanuel Lenin, Ambassador of France to India, join us and address us on an absolutely, who would think we would be discussing this topic with France, resilience in the Indo-Pacific. So a very, very interesting topic and an absolutely amazing um, foreign service person. So thank you so much for joining us. A warm welcome to you, Ambassador. We are truly honored to have you with us. Um, you know, when we met last at your office and I invited you to do this, who would have thought that, that days would change and instead of doing it in person, we are now having to do it virtually. So, but thank you for agreeing to do this virtually because we really feel our interaction with France is very, very important to us. Ambassador Mohan Kumar, um, always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, Dr. Mohan Kumar is the chairman of RIS and a friend of ours. So we consider him a friend and turn to him every now and then for his expert guidance and advice. Um, thank you for being with us, and um, thank you for chairing this very, very important session. I just wanted to welcome both of you and hand it over to Juan for you to take it over and introduce the ambassador and take the discussion forward. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kiran. Uh, it's a great pleasure, particularly because you welcomed both of us and you are the CEO and the executive director of Aspen Ananta Center. Uh, so that's a great pleasure. But for me, um, uh, it's also a pleasure because I happen to know the ambassador, Ambassador Emmanuel Lena, the French ambassador in India, even before he was appointed as ambassador. So he was my direct uh, interlocutor in Kedor Singh, uh, the French foreign office when I was ambassador for my entire time, almost, he was my direct interlocutor, if not boss, because you know, uh, if there is an issue, <laughs> you know, say, and he was director of the division that they call Azi Oceani, which is, you know, really the Asia division. And so he was dealing with uh, countries like China, India, and so on. The other thing I must uh, tell you about Ambassador Lena is that I was just looking at his CV. I knew a bit of it, but some of it I didn't know. In terms of the Indian Foreign Service, the dream foreign service is if you can do a good multilateral post, if you can do a good bilateral specialization, and then you work in the high office, either with the prime minister or the president. I'm proud to say that Ambassador Emmanuel Lena has done all three. He was uh, posted in New York. He specialized in disarmament. He knows China well. He now knows India well. And he was director of the Asia division in Quai d'Orsay in Paris. And he was diplomatic advisor to the prime minister of France. It's my guess that just as uh, India chooses its ambassadors carefully to France, France does its the same. So uh, if you are diplomatic advisor to the prime minister, I hope I'm not wrong in saying this. He could have chosen his posting, and I'm particularly happy that he chose India. Um, this is, uh, I, I just saw his testimony that he has finished one year in Delhi, how time flies. And I get the feeling that not only things are happening under his watch, and we will talk a little bit about it, but also that he's enjoying his job. And that's, uh, that is something that is important for a, for a diplomat. So I'd like to welcome very warmly my friend, my colleague and the French ambassador in Delhi, Ambassador Emmanuel Lena. I just wanted to make a few housekeeping things. Um, mm. We will allow the French ambassador to speak for as long as he wishes. And then I will have a brief conversation with him. And then we turn to the audience for at least a 15-minute question and answer 
session and some instructions for the audience if i can read out please send me your questions throughout the session do not wait for me or others to finish you can as, as, as soon as you start hearing the french ambassador if something occurs to you please shoot the questions if you're watching this session on zoom use the question and answer portal so that you can do that and if you're on facebook you could do it on the comments section and i will get the questions um, i just wanted to begin by saying this is as, as kiran rightly said in her opening remarks this is a hugely important topic for india and uh, there are times when indians forget that france is a resident indian ocean power it's got a lot of real estate in indian ocean we have an indian consulate in reunion islands i've had a chance to visit reunion islands as ambassador and it's it's a great place and it's an important strategic post for both france and india for france of course it is overseas territory uh, we also forget in india that uh, 93% of the exclusive economic zone belongs to france they've got something like 1.5 million french citizens for those of you who are listening in who are academics and students please go through the french paper on security in the indo pacific it's a brief paper it's succinct and it gives you an idea of the interest the permanent interest that france has and i'm happy that this uh, particular conversation is happening in the backdrop of the trilateral that we've just had india france uh, australia the french have a wonderful expression which i heard for the first time in france variable geometry uh, it's a wonderful expression variable geometry and that sums up what is happening in the indo pacific we've got the quad we've got trilaterals we've got quad plus so there is all sorts of concentric circles in motion in the indo pacific but i cannot over emphasize the importance of france to all this especially because definitionally the french definition matches ours in terms of going a little bit to the west western indian ocean compared to other powers so actually there is a lot of convergence the last point i want to make is i think this has been said by foreign secretaries in the past if there is one strategic partnership that is entirely problem free it is probably france for india there is a degree of comfort that indians have when they deal with france uh, the other strategic partnerships are important i'm not saying they're unimportant but there is a certain degree of comfort this comfort is drawn from the fact that philosophically if you look at the french white paper on foreign policy i used to joke in paris all you have to do to make the french white paper an indian white paper is replace france with india and replace french with english it could be an indian white paper <laughs> in foreign policy in terms of multipolarity in terms of strategic autonomy in terms of the philosophical underpinning of foreign policy france this position and finally finally france has also stood by us whether it is 1971 1998 nuclear test this has been a friend which has stood by us through thick and thin so this is the brief background it's a great pleasure ambassador lena to welcome you i'm particularly happy that i'm doing this conversation and not somebody else so let me welcome you warmly and request you to make your opening remarks over to you ambassador thank you and i'm um, <clears throat> delighted to be uh, with over of you to, uh, to this this morning um delighted to be with ananta center because uh, i know the uh, our reputation of the center and good expertise and thank you uh, Iran for inviting me again it's a pleasure really to see you and i must say that on a personal touch i'm a big believer in uh, people to people exchanges exchanges of ideas uh, uh, i think that we we can not build anything strong between countries just on uh, trade or uh exchanges of any order if we don't have people to people exchanges of a common i would say philosophical and cultural uh 
foundation. So this is really important to me, and uh, I'm going to uh, to keep it holding myself a lot into this. I'm also delighted to uh, to see again my old friend uh, uh, Dr. Moine Kumar, and uh, is that very kind words and. Uh, 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 it's an understatement to, to, to say that I really value our friendship and uh, I remember fondly his uh, very positive attitude, uh, uh, dynamic, uh, youthful and uh, highly knowledgeable ambassador to Paris. He was uh, uh, very dear to the heart of French people and I must say that I'm amazed to see how well he did reincarnate into a scholar, which means that there is a life after diplomacy, and it gives me a lot of hope. Uh, I follow uh, uh, his paper, I follow his work, I follow also the work of his uh, institution, which is uh, very well known in France, and we hope to see uh, it taking part to the Paris Peace Forum in November, as it was one of the main founding members. So thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for the kind words you said. Uh, I won't have much to add. I mean, you said basically what I wanted to say, that France is a power of the past. You be much more eloquent than I could be. It's true that we, we feel that we are a power of the Pacific and we feel that we are India's neighbor. Uh, we're not stretching it. We, we have the, uh, the second uh, economic uh, zone uh, in the world, thanks to this territory, and it, we think that it gives us some power, but also some duties, and that's why we like and we want to work more and more with like-minded countries, and India is really at the top. You also had kind words, and uh, your mind about the, uh, the uh, uh, India-France partnership, saying, saying, recording your French executive words, saying that we were entirely comfortable with each other, that there was a degree of confidence. I can uh, say no better. I mean, uh, we, for us, that's the ideal partnership. We are friends and uh, allied in, in good and bad days. And it's always been like this. I mean, we, uh, when you had a, a strong decision to take, and uh, when you decided in, in 98 to make new tests, some countries blame you for that, some countries sanction you for that, and we were behind you. Because basically we understand that that's uh, uh, these are efforts to, uh, to gather our autonomy that we, we did decades ago, and so we fully sympathize with those. But the next year, I mean, you had some uh, uh, differences with a neighbor, we've been also fully behind supplying uh, munition and everything you need at that time. And it's always been the case, and uh, it will always keep like this. So thank you for your kind words. I really believe in, uh, in the partnership, in its value. And as you said, it's based on a, a common philosophy, uh, true. I mean, we are an independent country. We feel that we, we, we should make our decision by ourselves. That's true. We don't want to be junior partner of any power, be it, uh, I don't know, be it China, but the, the US. We feel that uh, we're a sovereign country and it's very important. In terms of value, you said it, we fully align. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, you being the largest uh, democracy in the world, uh, France uh, likes to, to think of itself as the, uh, the country of uh, uh, human rights, I mean, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the French Revolution. So we feel our value of them. There's also one point on the common basis of our partnership I would like to add is that um, we have also common interests. And that's very true. I mean, that's true in the Indo-Pacific space and beyond. And really that we see uh, for the coming decades, no reason why this strict alignment of values and interests would change. And that's the reason why we can also commit very long-term together on, on great programs and highly strategic programs and uh, Rafale, for example, is a, is a good, uh, is a good uh, illustration of this, because you cannot uh, really succeed in a program like Rafale, implying some technical transfer, or in a program like uh, uh, Deep Nuclear, we say we're very hopeful, 
And these are programs you need uh, total confidence over decades to, uh, to, to achieve them. So it's only between such strong partners as we are that we can succeed. Let me now uh, say a few words maybe on the, on the topic we, we picked up for this uh, uh, short intervention, uh, which is resilience in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, resilience is, I think, uh, really the word of these times. I mean, uh, this uh, uh, crisis, this pandemic has uh, uh, stressed uh, many of our weaknesses. And uh, it's been a, a very humbling time for all our countries, um, uh, but also uh, a, good, uh, a good incentive to, uh, to bridge these gaps and to be even stronger, or even resilient. Let me uh, maybe stress the three main uh, weaknesses that we have uh, identified on, on our part. First, I mean, it's obvious when we see our crisis evolve, the lack, the lack of preparedness uh, to face a major health crisis. That's number one. Second, uh, the link between nature, the environment, and our life use. I mean, the, uh, the coronavirus has been transmitted, as we all know, uh, to human beings from animals. Second, third uh, weakness, these are uh, economic independence and asymmetric economic independence. Particular our dependency on some countries which supplies basic products. But don't don't misunderstand me. Uh, I don't I don't mean that any uh, dependency is bad. Uh, they are some dependency that weaken a country and some dependency uh, that strengthen a country. All, all depends uh, on, on who's your dependent. I mean, we, we want to be basically to be more resilient, to be uh, more uh, self-sufficient, but also to rely more on countries, on multilateral frameworks whose value we share. And, uh, there are some dependency that helps you to, to shape your destiny and, and some others that deprives you of this capacity. And I think that's the uh, one, one of the main uh, uh, goal uh, of our country these days is to uh, be stronger with our best partners and less dependent on the others. And that's why the uh, uh, the world map is being reshaped these days. The supply chains are being reorganized in a very, very fast uh, manner. And that's why we have to be agile, we have to be creative and confident in, uh, in our great partners. And that's really this level of confidence we enjoy between uh, India and France. So let, let, me, let me start briefly uh, uh, with public health, uh, which was the, uh, the number one challenge I mentioned. In, in, in this area, um, uh, solidarity between our two countries has just been outstanding since the month of March. I mean, uh, there have been exchanges, political exchanges, uh, to consult, uh, to change best practices uh, between our two countries, between the Prime Minister Modi and Macron, between Health uh, Ministers, and so on and so forth. But there have also have been uh, exemplary gestures. I mean, we have still French people very grateful for the, uh, the shipment of uh, much dire needed uh, medical uh, drugs or to French hospitals uh, at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, and as you know, uh, my president was eager to reciprocate. And that's why uh, a few months ago, he, he, he decided that the, uh, the French Development Agency, AFD, would grant uh, an exceptional loan of 100 million euros uh, to India to boost uh, social services for the, uh, the population with, who have, which has been uh, uh, most affected. He also uh, uh, decided on the, on the shipment 
of testing kits and, and also a, a team of specialists. All these arrived, and there was a nice symbol uh, the same day as the Rafale arrived on the uh, soil. Uh, on, I remember that day very fondly, that was on 27th of uh, July. Uh, but the, uh, it, it will go beyond these uh, gestures. We, we have the ambition uh, to, to build a very uh, robust uh, uh, cooperation between our two countries, including on uh, research. India, uh, there's no question about that, is a key actor and producer of drugs. But France also has a great expertise in this field. We have internationally recognized with such centers, such as uh, Institut Pasteur, uh, Fondation Nerio, and uh, French companies uh, like Sanofi are very active in India. They have a, a production facility in companies like Hyderabad and others. And uh, they should open up uh, even more. And to achieve this resilience, uh, we also want to work and, uh, together at uh, a, a multilateral level. Um, as you know, uh, France supports the uh, access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, what we call in our diplomatic uh, language, ACTA initiative. And the, the goal, the purpose of this uh, uh, initiative is to uh, the, uh, reach uh, uh, an equitable uh, distribution of treatment and future vaccines all across the planet and, and to strengthen all systems. We don't approve of uh, countries rushing to secure uh, some, uh, some lots of, uh, of vaccine for their own population. We feel that these are common goods and it should be, uh, uh, it should be shared with uh, uh, global population of any country that I know that is the uh, uh, attitude that India has always had uh, towards common good. And we, 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 feel, we, feel as, we feel like this for obviously for philosophical reasons, but also for practical reasons. Because without universal access uh, to the future treatments, uh, we will face new wave, waves of COVID-19. If we want to reach global immunity, we need to have uh, global access uh, to uh, vaccination. And this is why uh, also uh, France is very active and, uh, uh, in uh, putting forward proposal to uh, reinforce uh, the WHO. And uh, we, there, there, there has been a long standing debate on the WHO. Uh, we have to be pragmatic. We don't deny uh, that this organization has had some, uh, uh, I would say, uh, deserves some critics. It's, it's highly unperfect as any uh, material framework. Uh, doesn't, doesn't mean that the uh, uh, the people working uh, in this institution, but the, the game that countries, uh, member country states are playing, make it sometimes dysfunctional. But this doesn't mean that we, we should get rid of it. It may, it's, uh, uh, it's a reason to improve, and that's in that spirit we, we're working. We're putting a, a new proposal to uh, make it even stronger and. Uh, uh, very confident that India will join in this effort with all its uh, uh, international goodwill. And uh, as India is a highly respected nation, uh, any material framework, and uh, as you know, we really value that, we support that, we support that as much as we want more India in the uh, material framework. And as you know, we've been a long standing supporter of India joining the uh, the Security Council as a member. It's a real delight to see India coming uh, to the Security Council for, for the next biennium, but we would like to see India uh, in a permanent capacity in the Council. We feel that the, uh, 
the council will benefit from it and we see we feel that uh, an efficient body has to reflect uh, the today's balance of power and uh, it has to be reformed let me say a few words on the second challenge that i mentioned i will be brief because to allow some time for our discussion right after but it's the challenge of uh, environmental protection and climate change uh, <clears throat> there, there are so many examples of um, environmental uh, evolutions which have impact on livelihoods and uh, ex except from uh, the relatively blue sky we have enjoyed during lockdown in Delhi uh, I have no no indication that the uh, COVID has really improved the situation. On the contrary, uh, we have to we have to be uh, to take some new initiative. And uh, India is very active, and I want to praise that. I mean, the, uh, the coalition for uh, disaster resilient infrastructures that was initiated by India uh, has to be strengthened. We uh, are fully behind, and uh, it's a great uh, idea to promote uh, disaster resilient infrastructures through research and sharing of best practices. And we, uh, my country, is really proud to have joined this coalition. But real resilience can only make progress through, uh, and thanks now to solar energy. All our scientists are convinced of that and I, I must say proudly that the leaders of our two countries are also totally convinced of that. I mean this is the low carbon and resilient way of producing energy and that's uh, the reason for our uh, long-standing commitment uh, behind the International Solar Alliance which was launched five years ago and you remember that because we were both together almost on stage uh, in, in Le Bourget uh, in December uh, 2015 and that was a very moving uh, moving time and uh, but the, uh, the alliance now is uh, alive and kicking and we 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 growing it will soon deliver uh, concrete uh, results in Africa and in other countries uh, and it's also uh, slowly but surely uh, being more and more international and i must say that in the history of diplomacy it's very unusual to see uh, an international organization that can uh, rise and, and, and get strong as fast as the international solar alliance i mean uh, see, see the main bodies of the un I mean, it takes ages after World War II to have them real efficient. So I'm, uh, I must say that I'm uh, really proud of uh, this uh, solar alliance. I mean, this is no obviously no reason uh, to stop making efforts, and uh, we obviously uh, want to uh, uh, to uh, to be to commit even more to. Uh, fulfill uh, and go beyond uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement and uh, as you may know uh, my country launched a uh, quite ambitious uh, recovery plan last uh, September and uh, one third of this uh, of the funding that were announced which amounts to, uh, uh, to a quite a staggering uh, amount of 100 uh, billion uh, euros uh, will be devoted to uh, biodiversity, to uh, uh, reduction of uh, 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 gas emission, circular economy, uh, decarbonation of the industry, and so on and so forth. And this is really important because we feel, and I think India uh, feels the same way that um, uh, uh, the transition, uh, ecological transition, is not an obstacle to growth, not an obstacle to growth, and we know our growth is important for our population, for their well-being, for 
uh, but can be also a real driver for growth and for innovation. That drives me to uh, my uh, last point and the last weakness uh, I mentioned, uh, which is uh, economic resilience and supply chains. Um, we, we, we obviously have seen how dependent we were on certain countries and uh, uh, in what situation that, uh, uh, that had led us. Uh, we need to uh, have uh, a more resilient technological base and uh, that we can do together. I mean, the uh, uh, European countries, they decided that they, they, they should localize more activity on their soil, but we all know that uh, won't be 100%, I uh, would say, repatriation of the, uh, of the activity. I mean, there are obviously uh, costs, uh, and, uh, uh, which, mean, which mean it wouldn't make any sense and it won't happen. So uh, the real resilience will mean for us to, uh, uh, to localize our, our supply chains in the countries like-minded, where we know that uh, in the next coming decades, uh, we won't have any problem or any trouble. And uh, India, obviously, on the top of the list, as I, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, it's been a long time bet for French companies who have been very bully about uh, investing in India. Uh, as you know, right now, there are more than uh, 350,000 uh, Indian employees in uh, uh, French companies on India soil. And we want to do more and more and more. We want to have production. We want to have uh, uh, facility, but also we want to have R&D centers because we believe that, uh, like us, you have the top world engineers and, and you, your country of full innovation, and that we want to uh, we want we want to improve. Obviously, uh, be more resilient does not mean to be uh, uh, living in, uh, in autarcy and, uh, and this was a thing I want to stress because I, 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 I uh, sometimes have a feeling that uh, uh, some people may understand uh, the idea of uh, self-resilience in a very uh, limitative uh, way. I mean, you, uh, being resilient, being uh, autonomous, doesn't mean to be autarcistic. When you show autarcistic, then you're going to just your, your economy are going to die. I mean, it's like animals. I mean, if you put them in a zoo, and if they don't, if they, if they don't live with uh, uh, other animals, if you are protected from, from competition for survival, you just don't make efforts. You grow fat, and then one day you die. You have to you have to be uh, in the real world, and also I mean if you want if you want to grab some supply chains and if you want the country to invest, then obviously you have to smoothen the process which, which is being done. I mean um, everybody is very impressed by the leap forward in in all the ranking that India has made in the ease of doing business. And, I mean this this has never been seen before such leaps in the history of the ranking, but. I mean, we, we see that you are, you're cutting red tape, you see you're making it more efficient, but also you should, you should close your border. I mean, if I, if, I, if I invest in your country, I need also to, to, to sell and also to trade to support my activity. And that's why it's very important that we, we discuss in, uh, in good faith uh, on, on commercial uh, aspects. And um, I know that uh, India is eager to, 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 to move forward on, a, on a, maybe a discussion on a limited FTA with, with Europe. It's important that we, we do it uh, in a responsible manner because we, 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 we want fair trade. We don't want just trade. We want level playing ground. We want good practice. We want uh, eco-responsible trade. But we need to trade. We can't be a classistic. That's a, a small message I wanted to pass, but uh, I know you're on the same page. Well, uh, I think uh, I could go on like this. 
uh, for ages, but I, I might uh, stop in a few seconds to uh, to allow for some conversation, uh, if you want. Shall I? Please, Ambassador, uh, if you I'm want done. to take a couple of minutes, otherwise, oh, I'm, you, I'm, are you I'm finished? Done. I'm, I'm done, boy. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Ambassador. That was a brilliant uh, tour d'horizon, if I may say so, uh, of uh, all that is relevant for resilience in the Indo-Pacific. I, I wanted to begin, if I may, by saying to the audience that France has been responsible for solid support for India, not just in the UN Security Council, where I think the audience needs to know that when core interests of India have been discussed in the recent past, I don't want to embarrass my French colleague, but France has always been the first to take the lead. So I just thought the audience should be aware of this. Secondly, when I was ambassador, France has helped us with the missile technology control regime, the membership. It has also supported us in the NSG, although unfortunately we haven't been able to become members of NSG. So I wanted everyone to be aware that France's support for India in multilateralism is not lip service. I think that is something I have to be honest in, us, in saying to the audience. But where I want to ask Ambassador Lena is there is a view in India that a multipolar world cannot happen without a multipolar Asia. Would you agree with this? Would the French agree with this Indian perspective? I don't want to talk about the elephant in the room, but just saying that if you want a multipolar world, you have to begin with Asia if you think that Asia is a dynamic region, it's an important region. So I, I wanted to begin by clarifying this philosophical point, if you like, Ambassador. Um, yes, man, you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, uh, Asia, it's not, a, it's not an overstatement to say that it is the region of the 21st century, it's the fastest growing region, it's the region uh, uh, which uh, has uh, uh, the largest chunk of uh, world population and it's going to be even more so with uh, uh, giants like India, uh, which I understand is going to peak somewhere at 1.7 billion uh, inhabitants by 2060, I mean, uh, which is for me mind-boggling. And, and also, uh, a region where we, uh, uh, and it makes sense given uh, what I just said, the strategic uh, balance is going to be even even more uh, important and tricky in the next decades. I mean, according to the uh, uh, figures I had, uh, uh, Asia uh, will uh, have now, uh, 50 percent of the military equipment by 2050 will be deployed in Asia, which gives uh, an idea of the shift which is going to take place and which is taking place currently. So uh, uh, Asia will be really, uh, uh, I hope not the uh, uh, the uh, re region where we witness uh, tensions and we would like it to see the region that we properly and fast organize in the coming decades to be, uh, to be uh, 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 an engine for good uh, in the world we're going to witness. But, uh, it's true what you say that uh, uh, for, for many reasons, and um, Asia is not the most organized uh, part of the world. I mean, uh, I, I'm not speaking like as uh, 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 organi regional organization like the EU, which is uh, 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 so uh, unusual and so exceptional. 
and uh, but, well, uh, there are reasons for that also. I mean, it, it took us two world war to understand that we needed to organize and cooperate uh, more than compete. But uh, I don't wish that for Asia. But still, uh, Asia seems to be a bit lagging behind uh, in terms of uh, uh, integration or organization. I mean, there, there might be some uh, historical reason. There might be even some uh, geographical reason. I mean, when you when you see the region between, I mean, uh, uh, the alternance of uh, small islands, high mountains. I mean, uh, it's it's really the uh, the land of diversity in mean, this region. But still, I mean, uh, given the uh, the spot is going to occupy in in, uh, in a world tomorrow. It will need to, to organize. Uh, and if it is not multipolar, balanced, uh, ruled by principle, uh, the, the, our world won't be, won't be uh, uh, multipolar, ruled by principle, uh, and well balanced. So that's a key, key, key uh, effort to be made. And, and that's why we, uh, we all uh, try to, uh, to make sure that in Asia also, and uh, the principles we want to see are clearly enforced. And that's the purpose we, we mentioned in the Pacific. That's why we do when we, we send our Navy to, uh, to patrol in, in the South China Sea, uh, because we want to uphold our values, the, uh, the freedom of navigation, uh, uh, the, uh, the respect for the law of the sea, and, uh, and that's, that will be even more important. So yes, if uh, we don't see uh, the emergence of a real uh, multipolar Asia, the world is going to be into trouble, given the importance of Asia. So fully support your, your view. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, there are a number of questions on Indo-Pacific, and I will come to it in a minute. But taking advantage of my previous role as India's ambassador to France, every single dossier I dealt with, I had conversations with you, with Elise, it was a sheer pleasure. Because as I said, there are no big issues. However, there is one dossier that caused me a bit of frustration. And that mm. was the trade and economic relationship between our two countries. Not, not because there was a problem, not because there was lack of effort on your side or ours, but as a former WTO expert, I did feel that we were somehow underperforming, if you like. There is potential for improvement in the area of economic and trade ties. But then I have now retired for three years uh, maybe there has been some improvement, but I just wanted a sense from you about the challenge in this particular area. But as I said, there are very few challenges really in other areas. It is just a question of taking it to the next level. The relationship is excellent. But I thought $10 billion or 8 billion euros, the figure might have changed, uh, did not do justice to either India or to France as two big economies which are capable of cooperating. Can I have your reaction, Emmanuel, on this dossier? Of course, Simone, although I don't know if I should venture and discuss that subject with such a distinguished uh, former WTO expert, huh? uh, but I, I can only agree with you. I mean, the, uh, the, trade, the trade relations are, are not where they should be. And, uh, uh, basically, if you if you look at the figures, it's uh, it's totally depressing. Even the uh, uh, the political uh, strategic relation we enjoy. I mean, uh, the market share of uh, French uh, company in India, French company or my country in in trade with India is zero point eight percent, and it's. Uh, it's a clear reflection of the, uh, the difficulty we have to, uh, to trade. And um, I, should, I should say, to be totally honest, that uh, we, we do compensate a bit uh, by uh, direct, direct investment. Uh, and uh, French companies are among the largest investors in India. 
uh, and for, for since a long time. I mean, companies like uh, uh, Capgemini or tech companies, Atos and others are, are big, big uh, in India. I mean, uh, Capgemini has 150,000 employees in India. Uh, but uh, on the trade side, uh, as you mentioned, it would do much better. Why? Uh, obviously, there are some barriers we are, we are not totally uh, satisfied with. And, uh, but these barriers, uh, uh, tariff or non-tariff, do apply to other countries. So it doesn't explain why our share is, uh, is, is limited. Uh, also, also maybe uh, we've been focusing a lot on uh, large uh, strategic procurements and contracts, which are important. I mean, uh, we've been, uh, we are very strong in uh, defense. I mean, uh, as you know, we st uh, that's so started to uh, uh, to to sell, to, uh, sell planes to India in early 1950s, 1953. If that uh, I remember properly, it was called the Tufani, the uh, plane. But we as uh, and so we, we've been working a lot on that. And, and maybe we have neglected uh, for a while all the, uh, I would say, the regular business uh, where, where company, French companies are outstanding. I mean, the uh, 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 consumer goods, uh, I mean, food, 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 food and wine, with all other countries across the planet are number one in our export. India, there are maybe some particular obstacles and problems that uh, uh, we'd like to, uh, to, to, to be lifted and uh, we discuss, but I know it's, uh, it's not easy. But, uh, be, but otherwise, I mean, we, our companies, and that's why I'm, I'm quite optimistic, have a lot to provide for the next phase of, um, uh, of the, uh, 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 the emergent the development of India. Why? Because if you if you if you look at the next challenges for India, one of the top challenges will will, will be uh, urbanization. I mean, we all know that in the coming decades, maybe in the in the next two decades, there will be something like uh, let's say three hundred new million uh, uh, urban dwellers in India. I mean, this can only uh, be sustainable if we radically transform the way uh, cities are built, operated, where, where our people are transported, how they, 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 they consume energy, how they consume water. Otherwise, it's just going to be a nightmare. I mean, uh, well, people are not going to survive. I mean, people are, are not going to survive, not going to be politically viable. And uh, this uh, can only be achieved through technology. And the good thing is that French companies are really world leaders in these technologies. They have the, the answers for these problems. I mean, if you take the water problem, company like Veolia, like Suez, if you want to, to for water sanitation, if you want to have uh, also smart grids and uh, uh, smart meters, I mean, company like EDF, like uh, uh, Schneider are also top. If you want to have uh, 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 smart and efficient transportation to avoid that uh, you, 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 uh, the countries are, are just totally locked with traffic jams and you, you can't breathe. I mean, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, companies like uh, obviously SNCF, like uh, uh, Transdev, like Alstom. Uh, which can build the best of the best of the of the subway, of the uh, tramway, and uh, and so on and so forth. So that's why I'm quite optimistic, and uh, I'm sure that we will see more and more uh, of the French products and uh, know-how in India in uh, in the coming years. But I can agree, agree with you. We are uh, underachieving right now, underachieving. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. I would also request you to support uh, an effort.
between EU and India. We need the support of our French friends. I have been a big votary of an FTA. I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate uh, we missed the bus, but it's never too late. And I see that EU has signed an FTA with Vietnam. I think we can certainly do one with India as well. Um, Emmanuel, there are quite... Uh, one, one, one. Uh, may, may I say just one word on that? Uh, Please. I'm f fully, fully in line with you. We, we support an FTA, but we support an ambitious FTA. I mean, okay. uh, and, and when, when we mean ambitious, we mean ambitious for, 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 the, the, category, for the product categories, but also for climate. Uh, I have to say, because these days, with our public opinion in Europe, with our uh, the need to go through the European Parliament, if there are no strong provisions on, uh, on climate in an FTA, it won't fly. I mean, uh, our negotiator can negotiate, but it will never be ratified or approved. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I think the audience needs to know that as well. Uh, I'm, a, I'm absolutely convinced that whether it is data, whether it is climate change, we need a solid cooperation framework with Europe. Without Europe, it's very difficult for India to do these two. That's my personal view, by the way. There have been a lot of questions, Emmanuel, uh, so I will channel some of these questions in terms of topics. One is from uh, Ravi Velour in Straight Times. He's a good friend as well. Um, he says, um, you know, there have been uh, the presence of uh, Charles de Gaulle in the South China Sea and so on. Um, how closely can France work with the Quad countries? So that is the question. There is Mr. Suresh Sarangi who goes one step further and maybe to just provoke you, can France join Quad? Should there be an invitation? So these are the two questions. So one is working closely with Quad. And uh, uh, the second, of course, is um, should the occasion present itself Will France be happy to join Quad? So I leave those two questions for you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these are very good questions. I mean, the, uh, uh, I think we're like India on this. We're very pragmatic and not exclusive. I mean, uh, I see that India is working with a Quad, that India is also ensuring that the same values are upheld with countries like France, like Australia. Uh, and that was the uh, uh, that, that's the uh, we can we can see uh, we have a very good very good progress we, we we're making uh, on our trilateral format. I mean, the, you mentioned this uh, uh, very good meeting uh, at uh, French secretary level. Uh, I, I'm sure we're going to uh, to have something at uh, uh, ministerial levels soon. And some also some uh, common uh, exercises uh, uh, on the ground, on the sea, uh, and, may, and maybe one day on the scale uh, we enjoy on a bilateral basis, like with exercise uh, so impressive as Varuna, uh, which we had last year. Uh, uh, sadly, we couldn't do it uh, this year because of COVID, but I'm sure we're going to resume next year. Um, uh, will will uh, will France join Quad? Uh, I don't think we've been totally invited, but uh, uh, I think we have plenty uh, plenty of uh, occasion to uh, uh, to work in the same direction with like-minded countries. Um, the only difference we might have sometimes is a, is a tactical difference. We 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 feel that the uh, we should. Uh, uh, we, we, we should work uh, to promote values. We should work uh, to promote also uh, uh, alternatives, uh, uh, democratic, uh, sustainable alternatives to, to the country in the region. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to commit themselves uh, with a certain power uh, that will uh, then uh, get hold of their uh, natural resources or their ports or their whatever for centuries, but uh, so we, we want we want to be for an alternative. We want to uh, to promote some values, but we, we, we don't see any value in uh, in 
being confrontational or uh, uh, with so and so. Uh, we, we, we fight for ideas and values, rather. But uh, uh, I, I think all, all the efforts are really uh, uh, moving in the same direction. Uh, and I must say that uh, very pleased to say that the, the quad uh, seems to be picking up and uh, uh, that there will be soon, and uh, uh, as soon as tomorrow, if I understand correctly, uh, a ministerial meeting of this, uh, uh, I wouldn't say body, but of this uh, format. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. So moving on from there, you rightly said that uh, uh, Asian integration, there is a deficit as compared to Europe and other parts of the world. There is this question about, uh, which has also been posed by Suresh uh, Sarangi, which is, an, which is a very interesting question. Is the existing architecture in Asia sufficient or do you think new architecture needs to be constructed? I mean, we have so many concentric circles now, if you take the Indo-Pacific, but in every forum, India, Prime Minister, others have been saying ASEAN centrality is important. So this is what we've been sowing, saying so far. But the question is, do you need new architecture, you think, in Asia? Your personal view, I'm not even asking for an official French view, but uh, purely from a foreign service perspective, do you think the architecture makes a big difference to integration and so on? That's the question, really. Well, that's a, that's a big question, um, and I, I know that uh, tons of books have been written on that by a knowledgeable scholar from India, from elsewhere uh, in the past. So uh, I, will, I will try to answer you with uh, as much humility as possible. Uh, I mean, there might be, there might be some uh, organization which, which were created for different purpose uh, during, during the Cold War and thing, which uh, might not be, uh, need to be a bit reoriented, but basically uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that the uh, region uh, suffered from a lack uh, in organizations. There are plenty, but for a lack of uh, functioning body, yes. And, uh, and this this re, this needs some uh, real will and uh, and commitment and uh, but I think I think that's what India has. I mean, uh, we we've been we've been uh, impressed also by our Prime Minister Modi uh, to be initiative within SARC and uh, held the meeting in spite of COVID during that period. But it, it will take some a lot of political clout to uh, to get to get them moving. Yeah, but it's uh, it's really necessary. Thank you. Uh, the question was posed by Subhashish uh, Sarangi, not Suresh Sarangi. So I apologize. I apologize for that mistake. But uh, moving on, uh, really, the resilience uh, supply initiative or the supply resilience initiative is it something that France would be interested in joining or supporting? That is a question as well. And as you know very well, Emmanuel, and I think you spoke eloquently, this resilience is something that, is, uh, uh, that has come into uh, the foreign policy lexicon or dictionary post-COVID. And I don't know what resilience means to you, but to me, it means trust. Uh, you, you need to have trust, whether you're going to do uh, maritime security, you're going to do trade, you're going to make personal protective equipment for public health. The question now, which seems to have come to the fore, is trust. So the Resilient Supply Initiative, do you believe it can be expanded? And uh, what would France's perspective be in this regard? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mon. I think it's a very good initiative, and we, we totally support that. Um, as you as you know, French companies have been a pioneer in making India, and before uh, any other companies, we've been very much willing to uh, uh, to uh, to support uh, India's aspiration to be more self-sufficient, self-resilient. 
I mean, uh, they've been in many cases uh, willing also to transfer some technologies because they, 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 they know that in India, uh, these technologies will be used properly, that uh, uh, you could share technology, that uh, your IP would not be uh, uh, taken from you uh, without you willing, and that uh, India is a rule of law. So uh, totally, totally, uh, totally, totally uh, uh, ready to support the, this, this initiative. And I, I think that um, uh, I can tell that currently, without uh, telling any secret, uh, there are some French companies who are carefully studying uh, the possibility to uh, to bring back to to India some uh, some supply chain. And well, thank I, you very much. Yeah, and, uh, and I and I have. Uh, quite frequently some very good discussion uh, with your trade minister, Mr. Goyal, uh, and each time I, I talk to him, I feel very confident that the, uh, the country is doing whatever it needs to do to, uh, to be even more business friendly and to, uh, uh, to welcome some foreign investors. Uh, cutting a tail making uh, some uh, even better infrastructures and uh, and making sure that the uh, uh, difficulties that uh, that may arise uh, can be can can be uh, uh, efficiently solved and uh, uh, in the uh, coming weeks we should be able uh, i'm very proud about that to set up a, a fast track mechanism to solve the problem that uh, some French companies may have some time in, uh, in India, but also uh, some Indian companies uh, in France. And uh, as you know, we, we, we wish also to have uh, more and more and more uh, Indian in investors in, in France, because we feel that a good and sound economic relation is a two-way street. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. That's a wonderful point for me to close this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Aspen Ananta and our good friend, mutual friend Kiran, may I thank you very much for your time. Uh, I want to commend you, especially for your candor and frankness in addressing some of these questions. And I know as a serving diplomat, there are other constraints. So I would like to thank you particularly for it. And I'd like to close this webinar with the hope that if there is one relationship that is likely to be crucial for the prosperity of multilateralism in the world, I dare say, with some prejudice, of course, that France and India can make a huge contribution in this regard. So once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mohan, and thank you, uh, uh, thank you for, for Kiran, and uh, thank you for uh, the Institute to, to welcome you. Thank you.